before we jump into this, what have I missed? What's uh, life throwing your guys' way these days? Uh, la- well, last episode was basically me having a therapy session. It was just as tough, man, with with um, with assistance, with just oh. dentistry in general. You know what I mean? Uh, you'll see, like, you know, um, with the, oh, by the way, how did it go with telling your team? <laughs> yeah. Woo. Well, it, um, <laughs> you know, no one likes change. So I right. think uh, some people were upset. Some people were understanding. Um, eventually, they'll, they'll all be okay. Uh, one sale closed fully. The other one's supposed to be closing uh, uh, next uh, Monday or Tuesday. Oh, wow. Um, okay. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's weird because uh, staff never have a problem telling you they're quitting or going somewhere or taking time <laughs> off or whatever. But when you try to make any change in your life, they treat you like you're the biggest you know, deceiver, deceptor ever. Um, yep, yep. Sounds like you should have had a therapy session. <laughs> I definitely need <laughs> one. It I sounds definitely... like you should have had a therapy session. Oh, my God. Well, listen, this going to school is going to be therapy for me. So I'm super yeah. excited about the change. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I, I will say uh, you're going to have to have a little bit of patience. I remember because I had worked before I went into residency. Mm-hmm. And when you go back into residency, you have to have the residency mindset, not uh, working out in private practice mindset, which is go, go, go. Right. Residency is going to slow you down. And yeah. I remember that was like the hardest thing for me was just like, oh, my God, why is this taking so long to do this? And why am I getting a check for this and doing this and doing that? And, right. and, and you know, you just go back into the whole school system again, yeah. you know, where everything needs to be double checked, quadruple checked, and it just gets really annoying. You know, so I think that was the hardest thing for me. And I'll speak just for myself, you know. Yeah. What about Kyle? Did you work at all? Did you go straight out of school into your... Uh, I I took a year off between college and dental school, but from dental school through residency and out, um, it it was all pretty consistent. There was no time off there. So I I didn't didn't have to deal with that change of mindset. Yeah. But if I were to have to go back now and go through all the bureaucracy of the schools and dealing with, (laughs) you know, different personalities there and people telling you what to do, what not to do. And um, the, the, the ideal school way versus some of the compromises you have to make in private practice occasionally. Right. Uh, I can see how that would be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do anticipate some uh, or quite a bit of an adjustment. Um, but my, my motto I've been telling myself as kind of my, my mantra going into this has just been, you know, put your head down and do what you're told. Yep. You know, I don't want to ruffle no feathers. I, I'm already self-conscious about going in as an older resident with, you know, uh, quite a bit of experience. I'm very self-conscious of coming off as, or, or this, the faculty seeing me as, you know, somehow having a chip on my shoulder or coming in thinking I'm any better than anyone else. So I, I really want to spend the first at least six months just dispelling any of those um, preconceptions that they have and just being a fly on the wall. Yeah. You know, that, that, that's smart. Uh, but, you know, I guess what I would say is just don't limit your own talents, right? You have way more experience than you. you okay, let me let me put it this way. <laughs> when we started, we had to do like SRPs, we had to do our, our own SRPs, right? right? You have already done like ridge augmentations and stuff. That's like third year. Right. So you've already done a lot of stuff that, you know, you, so you're going to be going backwards and just going, I think what you need to do is just like, just have that patience to know that you are going to go backwards from their point of view. It's not a matter of whether or not you're better than anybody. It's just a matter of like, you kind of have to understand the program again. You know what I mean? And you just have to be patient, but hopefully they'll also understand that you have a lot of experience. You know, a lot of experience that takes the three years to get to, you've already kind of done that. And all you're doing is just hone in on other surgical aspects. You see what I mean? So right. that, that, that's the mindset that they come in with and the mindset that you come in, you should be perfectly fine. Yeah, I hope so. I know they did express, um, you know, some wanting to use my experience in some of the research projects they have coming up, you know, so I can yeah. definitely be a, of a lot of clinical assistance to them. Yeah. Um, you know, as just a, a worker bee, which is great. You know, I'll, yeah, gain a, I'll gain a lot of experience just being yeah. a part of a research project and, 
you know, so I, I, I'm excited, you know, and uh, for the first time I'll have my own bachelor pad. I've, I think I went from my mom's house to being married to now back to my mom's house. And this will be the first time in 40 years I've had my own spot. And so right, right, right. <laughs> that'll take some adjusting, but I've had, uh, my daughter has come out and helped me. Uh, my, my daughter has taken on the role of just my life organizer. <laughs> so she came about- out. That she, came out, she took me to Target. She she made yes. lists. This is what you need, you know, first aid kits, soaps, shampoos, <laughs> you know, the, the little pockets for your your like sponge in the sink and the little brushes. Things that I would <laughs> never think about. <laughs> you know? You know what that sounds like? It sounds like you're going back to college for the first time. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> like, you know how I, like in college your parents would like do your dorm room? That's yes. basically it sounds like that's what you're about to do right now. Listen, my my life has been in Benjamin Button mode these last like years. <laughs> so <laughs> I've gone from owning practices to being an employee to now I'm going back to school to now right. living in a, a little studio apartment. <laughs> there it is. There it is. There it is. No, but I mean, you know, what I'm actually really excited about is this 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 uh this podcast because we're gonna start this whole brand of just presentations, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had pe- so many people ask us like, oh, why don't you guys present this case or this case? And, and I think that with your knowledge, especially with implants and everybody loving implants so much. I mean, I swear to goodness, I don't know anybody that doesn't want to do implants or want to talk about implants, mm-hmm. you know? And so when you came on, a lot of people were like, oh my God, like, okay, how did he get to this point? How did he get to this point? And you explained everything really well, but now it's just kind of like the visual aspect of it next, you know? So I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. I'm very yeah. excited to, uh, have you basically come on and just show us a few of the things that you do. And, and mind you, I'm, I'm talking to like the audience, like this is something that you normally pay for. So you're coming out of, you know, just basically out of your kindness, your heart to present this case, you know, free of charge, you know, Kyle, did you pay anything? No. I did. Okay, good. Well, <laughs> so, I'll invoice you guys later. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this, this, this is over now. <laughs> right. Thank you for coming in. <laughs> You know, but no, I honestly, I'm so excited, man, because this is something that you definitely, I mean, you, you, you lecture, you lecture to mm-hmm. multiple people, in multiple states and so forth. So, I mean, this is exciting to kind of get somebody of your caliber to, you know, uh, show our listeners like what to expect. I mean, you're going to be lecturing to pre-dental students, dental students, you're going to be lecturing to just new graduates. Uh, dentist in general, you know, uh, specialists. So there's a lot of people that listen all around the world as well. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm excited. Man. I'm excited. I mean, I know Kyle does implants. I do implants. You definitely do implants. So I figured, you know, we'll just go through this process. And, and you know, if we have any questions, uh, we'll answer it. And we'll basically pretend that we're our audience and we'll ask questions that maybe they might, you know, hey, what is this about? What is that? So we're going to basically revert back to uh, students, Kyle. <laughs> and we'll, we'll just listen, you know, intently and ask hopefully not dumb questions, you know? <laughs> well, listen, uh, um, I'm not going to say there aren't dumb questions. I've definitely asked a number of dumb questions in my lifetime. But definitely, um, if you can put yourselves in the perspective of some of your listeners, and if you see something, sometimes what we get caught up on is when we're, when you've been presenting for a while, and especially if you have a, an advanced audience like like the two of you are, you kind of forget what uh, some beginners may or may not know. So if I gloss over something or use a term or need to explain something, just jump in and say, hey, can you explain why you did this or why you did that? So we can sure. you know, make sure that people of all levels really understand the concepts and the principles and the reasons of why I chose my particular way of doing stuff. Awesome. And, and, and sorry to interrupt, but but... For anybody that's listening on the podcast, jump onto YouTube, uh, Tooth Be Told podcast, and so you can see all the slides that um, that are going to be shown. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, this is your opportunity now to kind of know that we do have a YouTube page, and it's been going for a while, you know, uh, and so why not just get in there and actually watch it? I mean, no one's saying that you can't listen to it on the on the podcast, but you definitely want to watch this one because this is going to be really exciting and, and you'll be able to kind of see, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Horton's beautiful face and then and Kyle's beautiful face, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> so well, you know, it just, it's, it's a good opportunity to get on it and watch a great presentation. I'm really excited about it. And we have no idea, no idea what this presentation is about. So we're all excited. We're finding this out for the first time. You know? <laughs> and, and, and like all the, the YouTubers are saying, hit the like button. and subscribe. That's right. There it is. There it is. <laughs> See? See? He, he, he's talking to PR, Kyle. He knows better. You know, so absolutely, definitely. But let's get started. I'm, get I'm started. real excited. 
Okay, so I'm going to start screen sharing the first case. So I wanted to present. Um, okay, I really don't have any sound, so I don't have to share sound. So I wanted to present a case that really gives the um, shows the challenges that a lot of anterior or aesthetic situations present. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a particular case that a lot of doctors who have seen implants come their way are probably really familiar with. This is a particular patient, as you can see in this slide here, number eight is missing. She came to me, I believe, when she was like seven or eight months pregnant. She had history of trauma to the front. Um, so this tooth, I believe, was already root canaled, but it had a large abscess. Um, and all we could do at the time because of uh, where she was in her pregnancy was just remove the tooth and, and treat the infection. And I wasn't going to attempt anything uh, too major uh, that close to her uh, being uh, uh, near her delivery time. Mm -hmm. But you can see when she did come back to me after everything had healed, she already delivered the baby. The, the soft tissue has healed nicely, but you can see a vis very uh, visible defect on the buckle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, with all this, obviously, we don't have to hammer the point home too much that CBCT is the standard of care if you're going to be doing these types of, of procedures, because it'd be extremely, extremely difficult, even in the most competent hands, to really plan this out effectively without some three-dimensional uh, information. So we do a CBCT evaluation. You can see that we have this huge defect. So at the time of the abscess, the entire buckle plate was just decimated. Um, and all that filled in, because there was no buckle plate to hold space, was soft tissue. This is what we are, are left with in a cross section. So I took a cross section right in the middle of this socket. And what you see is your, your palatal plate, and there's absolutely nothing on the buckle and soft tissue has filled in on the inside. So we have some work to do to be able to get an implant in here. Typically with these um, cases, my go-to is, is GBR. I don't try any heroics where I do GBR plus an implant at the same time when it's this involved. Um, I've seen some providers do that. It, I don't trust it would work in my hand, so I just, I, I'd like to stage it out and give myself predictable um, stepping stones to be able to move forward to the final uh, prosthesis here. And break down what a GBR is for us real quick. So guided bone regeneration. I'm just going to slide out of screen so I can close that window real quick. Um, it's it's a, a, a treatment protocol in which you're using um, bone graft materials, um, resorbable or non-resorbable membranes, uh, potentially tenting screws, as you will see in this case, to be able to hold space and volume while you allow the body to turn over that bone graft material into its own de novo bone. Um, and so you're essentially using these um, regenerative uh, products to guide the bone in regenerating a full shape and volume to be able to eventually place an implant in there. So, the first thing I do after I do a CBCT evaluation, I, I looked at the soft tissue and decided what type of flap I wanted to, to perform. Now, in this particular case, it was really just the very center of the buckle aspect that was, that was missing. And we had some contours leading just over into where the socket was. So it was just in the center where I have empty space. So I didn't feel it necessary to lay too large of a papilla of a, um, of a flap. Um, and so my, my design was a papilla sparing flap where you see I don't touch the neighboring or the papilla of the neighboring teeth. I didn't want to risk any recession from the surgery. Um, and because I had contours up to this point and up to this point right there, I didn't feel laying that big of a flap was absolutely, absolutely necessary in this case. Now, had this abscess been a lot bigger and we were completely deficient even further out laterally, I may have had to extend this flap over and include um, the, the attached gingiva in front of the neighboring teeth just to be able to get a flap large enough that would allow me to put the materials and the membranes in. And when I close the flap, those membranes aren't too close to my incision points. But given this particular defect and the fact that I have maybe about three, three and a half millimeters 
um, of good solid contour on either side of these papilla, I didn't feel it necessary to, to potentially compromise um, the gingival levels that we had. And I love the fact that you actually, you know, kind of analyzed that before you even touch the patient. Right. You know, a lot of people just go in just thinking, I'm just going to do the same thing over and over again. Most of the time, people will just go in and take the papilla and open up and maybe extend your incision, one or two teeth on either side. Correct. But in this situation, it's absolutely unnecessary to do that because you're just going to cause more issues. And people need to understand that once you remove the tissue off of your bone, you, you might cause what? Recession. Yeah. And, 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 and honestly, if, if we're being you know, full disclosure, I've had cases where I felt I had to extend the flap out more. And even though in general, the case looked good, when I go back and look at the before and after pictures, there is that little bit of recession or you see where the, where the crown ended and then you see a little bit of root structure. So you've lost maybe half a millimeter or so of, of attachment there. And it's heartbreaking because that's not what you were intending to do. Um, so as my skills, my, my experience and my skill set have grown, I've become a lot better at really treatment planning and analyzing that before I even start to decide whether I'm going to, you know, when do I include the papilla? When do I extend it out? How many teeth I extend it out and so forth. So, um, but so you see here, I, I do have the flap. What I like to do is remove any remnant of any soft tissue. So I'll take a curette. Sometimes I'll take a curette that's got a serrated um, blade on the spoon and I'll really scrape this bone really good just to get rid of any remnant periosteum. Um, any remnant scar tissue and scar tissue can sometimes be pretty tenaciously attached. Um, and then of course, we like to get bleeding from the, the internal medullary bone as much as possible. So even though you see some bleeding here, this bleeding is, is not very extensive. Um, a lot of this bleeding sometimes can be misleading. It's just coming from the soft tissues and just seeping down onto the bone. You really want bleeding coming from the internal vascular medullary portion of the bone. And the only way to, to really achieve that is to do what's called decortication, where you take a small round burr or a small 557 and you puncture holes through the cortical bone just into the medullary bone. You don't have to go super deep. You just want to make sure that there is some type of vascular communication um, from that medullary bone to the, the overlying onlay um, allograft or xenograft that we're going to be putting on top of this bone to create volume. Um, bone likes to come from bone, and so we got to get good solid bleeding from bone to get into our bone graft material um, so we can have success. So you can see these little holes here where I've pitted through the cortical bone into the med uh, medullary portion. Now, not in every case will I use a tenting screw. Um, in fact, very rarely do I use a tenting screw. In this case, however, I was very um, paranoid that I, even if I over-engineered by adding a whole lot of bone grafting material, that in the center where I definitely needed the bone and the contour going forward, that it would, it would cave in due to pressures from the lip, right? So we know that there's, there, the one thing that can cause a bone graft or a volume of bone graft to shrink while healing is pressure. And there's a lot of inherent pressure that just comes from just having your lip and talking and eating. Every time you do this, it's putting pressure down on the underlying tissue. Um, and so what I wanted to do was add a tenting screw that's a solid enough structure that no matter how much tension I'm putting with my soft tissues, it's not going to bend or fold or push in. It's going to hold that space or volume. With that lack of compression because of that tenting screw, now that allograft that we've added in is going to have the ability to stay in place um, and, and allow the body to infiltrate it and turn it over into its own bone without dealing with the uh, pressures of the soft tissue from, from the top. In some cases, some providers usually will use multiple screws. In this one, because it was just the center that I was concerned about, and um, as I mentioned before, there was already pretty good contours just lateral to that center defect. I didn't find it necessary to put more than one screw. However, 
the, the screw head size will come in different um, options. And I did choose a larger, more umbrella-like shape for the screw head size. So that way it really covered the, um, the span of that defect pretty well. Without getting too far in the weeds, uh, can you talk about the type of bone you used and why? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a, a typical proponent of just plain allograft, which is human cadaver donated tissue. Mm -hmm. um, there's some areas where I might use a mixture of xenograft, typically, uh, and that's a bone from a different species. Um, there's different options. You can use bone, uh, pig bone, bo uh, bovine or cow bone. Um, I've seen on the market now they're using a uh, camel bone in, mm -hmm. in, in some regions. But my typical go-to is just human allograft or donated tissue, um, especially when I don't need that much volume. So in this case, with the tenting screw, I was pretty confident that, you know, within four months I would get a good clean volume of bone. Um, as you'll see in some of my, in my next case presentation where I was really relying on the graft material to hold a lot of the space, I put a mixture of allograft in there or xenograft. And the reason uh, a lot of providers will use some portion of bovine bone is that it takes longer to resorb and get, and get broken down by your body. So it holds that space and volume for a longer period of time which allows your body to turn it over and develop bone in that volume of space that you're creating. Um, in this particular case, I felt the tending screw did that um, more than well enough. And so I didn't need to mix any, any xenograft with that. Uh, but anyone that has followed my cases, I, you know, I don't show it here, but I almost always use platelet products in my surgery. So this allograft is um, hydrated with uh, the exudate or the leftover liquid from making my platelet rich plasma membranes that you'll see here shortly. Um, and what that does is it does, it, it, it infuses the bone with a, a high concentration of platelets, a high concentration of fibrin and platelets are what release a lot of those initial cytokines and chemical indicators that direct healing. Um, so we're, we're, we're giving, you know, this bone, some Wolverine, if you're into comic books type uh, healing factor in, in potential, giving it the potential to heal with uh, at a higher rate with potentially higher quality by giving it uh, almost 20 times the amount of initial growth factors that a natural healing site would have otherwise. So I've screwed in the tenting screw and you, you screw it into the back side, the back plate of bone, and you want it to leave it sticking out to roughly where you want your final contours to be. And so what I do is I look at the neighboring contours and, and the volume of bone and soft tissue that I have, and I try to build some uniformity if I were to draw an arc line right here to build some uniformity in that contour. And that's how far out I'll leave the, the tenting screw. And then the rest just gets filled in, all that empty space gets filled in with the allograft uh, material. Um, now, me being me, I like to over-engineer. Um, you're always gonna get some shrinkage when you're healing. Um, and so over-engineering means if, if I build it 30% bigger than what I technically need it, even if I get 20% shrinkage, I'm 10% in the green right now with more than enough volume for what my desired final product will be. Once I've got the tenting screw and the allograft in place, I cover it with a resorbable collagen membrane. I've never been the type to really use non-resorbable membranes for the types of surgeries I do, and, and, and maybe it's the, the limited types of surgeries, I, I should say, that I, that I attempt. Resorbable membranes have always worked just fine. And there's two options when you get resorbable membranes. There's the standard resorption time, which is usually anywhere between um, six to eight weeks um, before that that membrane resorbs, or there's the, um, in my particular case, I use one called Heliman Advanced, which lasts anywhere from 12 to 16 weeks. So in cases where I'm trying to get larger volume and I wanna give the, the body more time to turn that bone over, I might use an extended time resorbable membrane, 
which gives the body an extra month or two of blockage. Now, the reason we use the resorbable membranes is we're trying to block off or occlude the cells from the overlying soft tissue, this gum tissue that I'm going to fasten over the top of it eventually. We want the volume of bone we're trying to create to mainly be infiltrated by the underlying bone cells from those holes that we created in the, in the cortical plate. We want mainly only those cells to infiltrate that volume and create new bone. If we don't block off the cells that could potentially infiltrate from the overlying soft tissue, then soft tissue, since it grows and develops much faster than bone, is going to infiltrate that volume you're trying to create, and most of it is going to turn into soft tissue rather than the health, good, healthy bone that we're looking for. So in most bone grafting cases, you're going to need some type of membrane, whether it is one that absorbs on its own or one that you got to have to manually take out yourself later. You need something that's going to block off the soft tissue cells from infiltrating that volume of space. So you'll always see me use some type of collagen membrane, which does that for us. Now, like I said, I use a lot of platelet-rich uh, products. So once I place my bone, whether or not I use a tenting screw or not, I will then cover it with a collagen membrane, and that protects that underlying bone from the soft tissue cells, as I've explained. But what I also want to do is introduce something like a platelet-rich membrane, which again has the, the fibrin matrix, the extra platelets. Um, it has some separated white blood cells that really help fight infection and modulate the inflammatory process. I will we'll put that on top of the collagen membrane to help the soft tissue healing. Um, and you know what you'll see in, in this case and in the next case is that there is a very marked effect. I can't absolutely tell you that I can clinically notice the difference of effect between using PRF and not using PRF in the bone because I feel like I've always gotten good bone, but I can absolutely attest to a, a very, very noticeable soft tissue healing effect where the soft tissue tends to heal faster with less morbidity or discomfort or pain, less incidence of infection and just looks better. And it gives you confidence as a clinician when they come in for that one or two week post-op and it looks great. Um, you, you sleep much better at night when that's your post-op uh, result that you're looking for. And then what I try to do when I, when I suture these flaps back, typically on a flap like this, I will start by doing a horizontal mattress suture to reattach the edges of this crestal incision. What you're, in the anterior, if you don't line up your flap in a, in a clean way, what you end up having is instead of your two flaps coming together at the seam, if you line them up and they're either pulled or one over the other, you're gonna get a formation of scar tissue along that line, which in a person with a high smile line can be noticeable and sometimes unseeming. So what I like to do is start reattaching the flap in a way that lines up the seams. And for me, it's always worked well to take this, this Cresto incision, incision portion or, or incision line and line it up with a really strong mattress suture, which cinches it together and doesn't allow much movement. So that way, as I'm pulling on the lip and trying to do my sutures along the, um, the vertical or, or the diagonal um, uh, incisions, it, it's not allowing this portion to be pulled. And what some of you may have seen is when you're doing these, if you don't have good protection of uh, replacing your flap where it exactly was, as you're tying your sutures along your seams, you start getting this pull. And now all of a sudden, most of this tissue here is positioned slightly left of center. And then when you're doing your right side uh, sutures, you really have to stretch and get tension and it just causes scar tissue to occur along those lines. So I like to tack it down with a, a horizontal mattress suture right here. Then I'll do one suture in this corner, one suture in that corner one suture midway, one suture midway, maybe one suture here and one suture there. So I'm trying to evenly distribute the amount of tension that these sutures are putting on your flap to really allow those seams to come back together in, in as close to approximating their initial position. 
Um, and that just leads for just cleaner uh, healing lines and less uh, incidence of formation of scar tissue. And any special consideration to the type of suture that you're using? Yeah, that's a good question. So I particularly like a, a monofilament because it doesn't wick. Anytime you use a braided, like a braided silk, um, over time, you get a lot of food accumulation, bacteria, and it can cause inflammation in the site. I use a, a resorbable um, PGCL suture. Um, it's a monofilament, so you never see any wicking, you never see any accumulation of food or bacteria. You're able to tie nice tight knots, and they usually last me, you know, anywhere about three to four weeks. Um, and that's you know, by that time, your incision lines have started forming nice, firm connections, and you're not worried if one comes loose or you got to cut them out. Um, but definitely, if there's any type, you know, you can use um, PFTE sutures. I just particularly like a resorbable uh, monofilament, you know, like a PGCL. They're just very clean. They're easy to work with, and they are resorbable, in, especially when you have patients that may be traveling to see you and may or may not miss their post-op appointments then you don't have to worry about them two months later, still digging at a suture, pulling on it, potentially causing um, some scar tissue just by messing with the suture. Because, you know, if it's resorbable within three to four weeks, it's going to be out of there anyway. Um, right. And by then your suture lines for the mo or your, your incision lines for the most part have already uh, tightly started forming connections and you're not worried about mobility of the tissue at that point. And when it comes to uh, suturing techniques, you were talking about just putting one on one side and one on the other side. Uh, do you do anything with continuous sutures to kind of even out the uh, tension? Or uh, do you just say keep it as simple as possible when it comes to suturing? For these type of cases, I, I like to keep it simple. Um, if I'm doing like a full mouth extraction and some alveoplasty and I have the entire jaw, you know, flapped ear to ear, I might do a like a running mattress suture. Mm -hmm. But even then with the running mattress suture, I've seen that there is a, some diagonal pull to it because there is a, you know, one of the suture lines is coming in diagonally. Um, but typically I like to keep it nice and simple. My go-to 95% of the time is going to be some type of horizontal mattress and mm -hmm. then some simple uh, interrupted sutures. All right, so patients comes in, it's five days post-surgery, and this is what we're looking at. And this is where I feel the PRF has really made a tremendous difference in, in the results I see in my practice. You can see the sutures are still there. There's no accumulation of food or bacteria. Um, there's, no, there's no wicking that we see with, with braided uh, sutures. Um, there's, even though there's some inflammation uh, it's very slight. You see there's some volume here. This, what, you, what you might initially see as swelling is just volume from the bone that we put in, but there's not a lot of red, angry, uh, scary looking tissue. And I would see more so of that before I was using PRF. Since I started using PRF, I see a lot less of that. So this is where we were before. You know, we talked about how there was a good palatal plate there, but this entire buckle plate down the center uh, with, a, with a cross section through that socket, the buckle plate was completely decimated pretty high up. I mean, this is the outline of where the root was and the bone is almost gone almost all the way to the level of the root. This is where we're at four months later. We see our tenting screw. We've got good bone volume. Now, mind you, and as you'll see when, when we do the implant, I always like to double check my bone. This can be deceiving, right? You can take a CAT scan and if you didn't get much bone turnover, this could still just be your allograft particles which are radio opaque and not good healthy bleeding bone, which is why whenever I do a bone graft, I always like to lay some sort of a flap, even if it's just a crestal flap, maybe pushed back just a little bit more so I can see that in fact, I do have a newly formed cortical plate that it's, it's um, got good color to it, that it's got some good bleeding to it, um, and that it's gonna be good, healthy, viable bone when I put the implant in there. And so- Can, can oh, I ask why uh, you waited four months? And, and how long do you normally wait for, um, before you go back in again? Is it always four months or? Uh, good question. I've, I've liked the four month mark for me because I don't feel like I'm pushing any limits. 
Um, if I'm doing a, a, like a sinus lift case and I'm trying to gain, you know, 12 to 15 millimeters of bone, I'll, I'll usually give it eight to nine months. But for a case like this, where we're trying to grow, you know, maybe five or six millimeters of good healthy bone in the center, then generally the four month mark has given me pretty good results on being confident that both the soft tissue and the hard tissue are very well uh, healed. Um, and so I can't tell you from experience what it looks like pushing the limits on that and going in sooner. Mm -hmm. um, what, 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 uh, what, what's your chronology look like for going back in after? A, a no, I, I, com I completely agree with you. I actually do, uh, for this, I'll probably do like five. So I'm very conservative, right? Okay. Um, but, you know, one thing that you actually did that I, I barely do, honestly, is that uh, fibrin. Um, it, it really makes that soft tissue look really good after right. about a week. Because that, that, what you showed um, in a week, five days, that would, that's how it would look for me in about two weeks. Right. You see? And I'm not ashamed to say that, but that's exactly the truth. Because then it's like natural body healing without any of the you know wolverine as you uh, <laughs> you know uh but that's exactly so so for me i just say give me an extra month past what you do you know soccer preservation i do about three to four months probably four months for soccer preservation if you have good bone formation and so forth but with this i usually push it to about five months but again i think it's because of the fact that i've done what I've, i'm just letting the body naturally heal so i find that five months you, i got good solid bone there Right. You know, and, and honestly, there's no wrong or right with a lot of the timing of things. Um, I'm still a three months guy when it comes to restoring an implant. Um, but a lot of the, the literature shows that you get the same results at six to eight weeks. Um, yeah, that's, that's let, let alone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let alone, you know, you have your 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 people that are presenting on immediate, um, you know, immediate loading and, right. and immediate provisionals, which is it's all great. I, you know, and when I first started in implantology in school with our with our implantology course it was six months yep right yep uh before restoring it was antibiotics at you know when you uncovering to put the healing cap you put them on an antibiotic regimen like so much has changed and what they're finding is the data keeps coming out that the body typically tends to respond pretty well in most cases and so those timelines have shortened but as a clinician, you always tend to uh, develop your own kind of routine and regimen that just makes you feel good. Yeah. Um, and so, so four months typically tends to be my go-to for most of uh, either uh, whether socket preservation, on-lay grafting, mixture thereof like this one. Um, and so okay. at... Okay. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, but I think in the end, we both agree that there's no point in pushing the envelope because you could have easily said oh, i'm going to place an implant here too and right. use the implant as kind of like your tension screw in a way right, right. Uh, and i've seen a lot of people do stuff like that and and for me personally i don't know why push the limit like that when you could just say i'm going to come back in four months place the implant because patients don't want to have to do stuff multiple times right you know so a few more months within the span of this lifetime of this implant i think it's it's kind of minuscule in the end right no i absolutely and i'm all about uh predictability and for me, staging it out has been very predictable. Um, and I don't, I don't like to mess with what works. Yep. Um, you know, and not to say that th there hasn't been some evolution in my practice. You know, there's times where you might cut the timeline shorter because someone's leaving out of town or they're leaving out of the country. And you have to do something, you know, three weeks early or four weeks early than you otherwise would have. And then it works. And you're like, oh. Okay, so you start getting that confidence of doing stuff, you know, restoring them at two months versus three months. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, but in, you know, and, and a lot of, for a lot of us, that's how our practice and our timelines evolve. And I'm sure at some point I may cut my time shorter, but this has really been my go-to timeline for, you know, probably the last maybe seven or eight years. Um, and I'm, I'm not into heroics primarily because, you know, I'm not ashamed to say it. I don't trust my patients. Exactly what I was about to say. <laughs> I don't trust my patients. Um, so I, I'd rather do it in a way that both uh, allows predictability, allows me not to have to worry, and still gives the patient some margin of safety and life. You know, this patient had a flipper the whole time. 
Um, so we weren't terribly worried about aesthetics um, during that healing phase anyway. So why, like you said, why push the envelope? So, okay, you brought this up. Uh, you said the patient had a flipper. Um, when it comes to flippers and maybe like an Essex appliance, mm -hmm. you, you talked about pressure on, in that surgical site. Right. Which way would you go when it comes to doing this kind of um, buildup versus maybe like a socket preservation? Um, and explain, can you explain the difference between the, um, the flipper and the Essex appliance and which one you prefer and when do you prefer either or? Yeah, so a flipper is essentially a, a standard temporary denture that has an acrylic base plate that covers part of the roof of your mouth and it has a tooth that's attached to it. So you, you, you pop it in and the tooth that's there has some acrylic that sits on this soft tissue area here. Um, and the concern is when the flipper is designed, is it pushing or impinging on this soft tissue area every time the patient bites down or smiles. And I'll be the first to tell you, I make really ugly flippers. <laughs> Why? Because I grind the crap out of it to make sure there is a big gap right there. And when they bite down, I don't like seeing that tooth that's on top of my grafted area moving. Right. right? I, I make sure that the occlusion is as such that so when they bite down, there's no pressure pushing that, por that portion of the flipper out. And I make sure that there is a huge gap. Um, and so I always prep my patients that I will give you a temporary tooth. It's not gonna be the most aesthetic thing. However, it's only for a couple months. Um, and actually now in the age of COVID, I've had most patients not even get the flippers or pay for the flippers because they're wearing masks anyway, most of the time. Um, so that's kind of been a, a godsend for me because I don't have to worry about getting something that's, you know, may or may not be comfortable, may or may not be fully aesthetic. Right. Es Essex retainers are essentially the type of retainers or that you see after someone has uh, orthodontics. And they're just the clear reta retainers that they put in. And there's a tooth in the, the missing place. Mm -hmm. I like those because when they bite down, those don't move. You can design them so they put absolutely no pressure on the tissue. Um, they're aesthetic. It's just like wearing a clear aligner if you do an Invisalign or clear correct or one of those things. Um, the downside is you can't eat with them, so you have to take them out to eat. Um, with some flippers, you may or may not be able uh, to eat with those either. I find that it's probably a 50-50 mix on what patients prefer. Some of them like the Essex retainers, some of them like a traditional flipper. Um, my go-to though has just been the the flipper and i can't really say it's because of any really logical or thought out reason it just and it just ends up being a part of my vernacular so when we talk about what we can do temporarily i say flipper we end up taking an impression of making a flipper um but like i said when i make my flippers i make sure that it's ground down in such a way which sometimes can affect the aesthetics of it to where it's not touching the tissue in, um, in the surgical site whatsoever. Because uh, the last thing you want is that acrylic pushing on your surgery site, pushing those lines open, compressing the bone, causing inflammation, um, and the patient not telling you because they just assume that's the way it's supposed to be. So they come in a week or two later and that tissue right where that flipper is hitting is angry and red or the tissue started coming apart. And then it just, you know, increases the chances of bad things happening. Right. So you can see here, I was a little bit more aggressive with my, my flap on this part because I really wanted to, well, A, I had to access the screw and I wanted to make sure that the bone was nice and healthy. But what I didn't show in this particular picture was that I wanted some extra volume and I was going to regraft this side after I put the implant in. Um, and given that, now mind you, there's times where I, um, I will spare the papilla and other times where I won't. I spared the papilla on this end. It's a little hard to see, but there's still some attached gingiva there. Um, but I, was, I felt confident being more aggressive with my flap, primarily because we didn't have any recession with the first surgery. And the bone levels initially were pretty good anyway. Typically, if when you sound the bone, when you're doing your probings, there isn't a history of bone loss in approximately and your, your pocket levels are normal. Your chances for recession, even if you include the papilla, are, are low. 
Um, and so I felt pretty confident being a little bit more aggressive with my flap, given that the first surgery yielded pretty good results on maintaining that soft tissue level. But you can see good, nice, healthy, hard bone that's bleeding, and it's not granular um, avascular bone. As I said, sometimes you can take a CAT scan and it'd be deceptive because even though it looks like there's bone there, it's really just remnant allograft that was never turned over. So I always like to check the integrity and the viability of my bone before I go back in and push it, put an implant in there. So in this particular case, I did a guided surgery. So I designed where I wanted the implant on a computer. Um, we have a 3D printer that we printed this guide that we designed with uh, Blue Sky Bio, which is a, a software that we use. And I'm able to place the implant exactly where I wanted it. And as I said, I felt like I needed a little bit more tissue in uh, and volume. And so I ended up regrafting if nothing else even if i got just a little bit of bone and a little bit more uh soft tissue even to the tune of just a millimeter millimeter and a half between the two of them i felt like it would give me much better aesthetic results looking at the contours that i was left with after the first surgery so here i put some allograft again i don't show the collagen membrane i, I I do apologize, I didn't take a picture of that, but then I cover that up with PRF. I again attempt to get some suturing. This was before I, I, I cleaned it up. Here we are at uh, five days post-surgery. Not, not a lot of uh, inflammation. The one thing that did concern me at my point, I'd like to point out some of the flaws in my techniques. I don't like this line right here. So I was very cognizant that we might have some recession or scarring right there. So had I done stuff different, I would have done my suturing a little different right in that area. Because now looking back at it, I can see where this potential scar and deficiency would have came from. And it's from not attaching the, um, the, uh, the seams as well as I would have liked to in that area right there. But the patient comes back four months later. We've got nice, good contours. And this is what I was looking for. I anticipated that over time, we may get even you know 20% shrinkage. And we were right about here. And I felt like being here was just too little. So I wanted to add a little bit of extra volume. So when it's all said and done, even if we do lose 10 to 20% of this, it's still going to be even with the neighboring contours of the teeth on either side. I take, I like to take a lot of CBCTs after the fact, and you can see with where my placement was and the grafting, we got a good, you know, two millimeters of good, healthy, viable bone on the buckle aspect. Um, and that's ideally what you like. You wanna have enough bone on the buckle of your implant to include a medullary component. If it's very thin, and often with a lot of our implants, especially when you go five or six years later and take a new CBCT, you'll see that the bone on the buckle is razor thin, even if the implant looks great aesthetically. Um, what I like to do is over-engineer it so that when it does heal, not only do I get a good solid cortical plate, but I get, even if it's just a minimal, minimal amount of medullary bone, because that means it's gonna be that much more vascularity on the buckle of that implant. And it's gonna hold those contours a lot better than just a cortical complex would that doesn't have a strong vascularity as a, as a medullary component. So uh, we're in the age of digital dentistry. And so this is just me showing the digital impression that we took and sending it to the lab. And then what comes back is the final result. So we're able to have nice good contours here that over time, over the next few years, there's gonna be some remodeling, but I built it up in such a way that as it does remodel and, and, and maybe shrink and become a bit more harmonious with its neighboring contours, it's still gonna be thick and natural looking um, because a lot of teeth have this 
root prominence or this natural contour over um, on the in the bone that's overlying the the root of the teeth. And what I want to do was build up that middle portion so we make some semblance of a, a root prominence in that area. Um, I was able to maintain my distal papilla. I got a tiny little bit of a black triangle, but I think overall, given the defect that we had, I'm not too unhappy with this result. And I am acknowledging that even though our technically our marginal, our free gingival margin is exactly where it was, you can see where the gingiva is a little thinner where I left that, that, that opening in the suturing to have that potential defect that we saw early on in the healing. So had I done anything different, I would have done a better job at suturing this area right here, just to make sure that this soft tissue was a little bit more plumper and, and, and thicker. But overall, I, I was pretty happy with this result. The lab gave us a great result in the crown. The patient was happy. And then I'll show you, you know, here's a, a pre-op photo showing the, the tooth missing and the defect in place. This is a, a, a periapical image of after the grafting with the screw in place. This is us designing the guide that's gonna sit over the, the, the existing teeth and allow me to drill exactly where I, de I decided I want that implant on the software. That's our implant in place. And then that's the crown attached to the implant. Um, let me ask a question about that. Um... Uh, um, somewhat small black triangle. Yes. A lot of patients might say, you know, uh, especially nowadays with the, you know, the world of Instagram, everybody thinks that they're models, right? And so, <laughs> you know, so, 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 so they might be like, oh, how do I fix this? Or can you fix this? And I wanted to kind of get your opinion on um, what are some of the things that are, you know, that you would tell a patient, you know, because for me, you know, I've, I've seen collagen, uh, injections in those areas. I've seen trying to do um, more soft tissue augmentation, you right. know, to try to get the papilla to plump up a little bit. Uh, but I haven't found anything personally that is predictable. We all get lucky once in a while. Right, right. <laughs> the key, right? Right, right. Um, honestly, for me, I would have tried to approach this if if she had expressed an issue with that, I would have tried to approach it prosthetically. Mm -hmm. So I may have just sent the crown back and tell them, hey, just add just a tiny bit of porcelain right here. It's not going to be enough to where your eye is going to be able to tell there's a difference in crown size, but it's going to it's going to block out that area just a little bit. So it's not very noticeable. That would have been my go to was a prosthetic fix. Um, That's it. That's it. Yeah, I see people, you know, I, I'm someone that does fillers. I do lip injections and so forth. I've never done them in the gums, but I do see it used. Presumably, it would give the same effect as you would get when you do, uh, you know, a, a Juvederm or Boletary Balance injection anywhere else where it looks great for a couple months and then your body starts to resorb it. And you, it's, um, it's a recurring thing you have to do. Um, and then you're right. Uh, do you risk doing yet another surgery to... to to a sensitive area that you've already gotten pretty damn good results on yeah. and risk, you know, mucking stuff up. <laughs> um, you know, so yeah, had she concern, had she expressed concern, a probably for me would have just been a, a prosthetic adjustment on this one. And when it comes to um, the way you did your, you sent it off to the lab. I yes. know a lot of, I know a lot of doctors that like to do their own um, crowns in-house with the Cyric. Right. Uh, machine, you know, or a melon machine of some sort. It doesn't have to necessarily right. be that company. But uh, what do you say about when it comes to, I mean, high aesthetics? I mean, you did, what you got was really good. You matched the color and the, the adjacent tooth really well. Right. What do you say about somebody that wants to do that in-house? And, and how, you know, how predictable of a result can you get with that? You know, I used to have a Cerec machine years ago. Right. Um, I was not very good at it because it really takes time to hone your skills at it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's much more cost effective and time effective to just put that in the hands of a laboratory that does this day in, day out. And usually what I'll do is I'll send the patient to the lab or have the lab uh, technician come in to do a custom shade. 
Um, and they can, you know, they see it with their eyes, they can use their own particular shade guides, they can take the pictures that they need. And usually a good experienced lab will be dead on most of the time as far as getting the right shade, getting the right characterizations, the right transitions and so forth. Doing it in house, I feel like you would have to spend so much time to get good at that. Mm. You wouldn't, you'd be taken away from your time to get good at the surgery, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, there, there, there's levels to this. And I feel for a high aesthetic case, you, sh you should let the master of ceramics take care of that. Um, because there's no way, it, it, it's not a, a good chance that most of us can be masters at surgery or very good at surgery and have had the time to be master ceramists in, a, in, a, in an in-house setting, no less. Right. You know, and, so I, I, you know, and I think this comes back to, you know, because just because you have a machine that you spend a good amount of money on doesn't necessarily mean you have to use it for everything. Exactly. Right. You have to kind of be, okay, you know what, in this situation, this works best. Right. Not, well, I need to use it because I spent the money on it. You know right. what I mean? Uh, and in your case just proved the point as, like you said, a, a master ceramist can get you exactly what you want. Patients are, I mean, this patient should be incredibly excited about this result. And then hopefully refer you other cases because they're like, look at what I have. Right. You right. know, the whole thing to dentistry, I always tell all my patients is if I do my job well, then no one will ever know that I was even here. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And that's the key. And a lot of people don't get that kind of result because they want to try to do everything themselves. Exactly. Exactly. And then you, you got to know when to punt the football, um, you know, to the better player. And, you know, I, and, and honestly, I, with, when it comes to CEREC, I have mixed feelings on just, you know, doing CEREC in general. I just felt like it wasn't for me. And, you know, I, I'd gotten competent at making posterior crowns pretty well and designing them. But again, it was taken away from my time where I could have been in the chair doing another procedure, you know, but instead I'm sitting here designing a crown, making sure it mills right, putting it in the oven, um, or you're just paying someone, you know, especially nowadays, you can get a zirconia crown at most labs for like $59. You know, what are you paying? Even if you've trained your assistant to do your designing and your, your milling and your glazing and all that, what are you paying them per hour if they're good at it right. to do that for you? And all the while, you know, are you having the patient sit in the chair for, for three hours while you make this crown? Do you bring them back? So to me, I just, I was never able to find a good model that maximized what potential Sarek had, but I know doctors that I have and it works for them and God bless them. You know, um, for me, me, for me, it just didn't work. Yeah. That's awesome. That's so awesome. Kyle, do you, do you use Sarek much? I, I don't, I have an intra oil scanner, just, um, just bought a cone beam that should be getting installed within a couple oh, of weeks. Nice. But, uh, I completely agree with, um, your thought process is, I, I like doing the dentistry. I don't like doing the lab work. I can, it's a better use of my time to send that out to people that do th tens of thousands of crowns versus trying to train myself or an assistant to do, you know, 30 crowns a month or 40 crowns a month, whatever I'm doing. Right. right. So, uh, Doug, let me ask you this question. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a, I mean, pretty intense, uh, surgery. It really is. This is the pinnacle. I mean, you rebuilt bone five, six millimeters. You've done the contour for the crowns. You set the patient's expectations. You've had to do a lot, a lot of prep work, right? How long did it take you to do the prep work before you even touched the patient to, you know, uh, to begin the surgery? Um, you know, if, if I were to calculate it, it's probably a good, you know, maybe hour and a half to two hours because I'm you know, you, I'm doing diagnostic models and, you know, trying to look at it from every uh, visual direction to really get a good idea of um, what I'm, what I have and what I'm trying to do. I'm studying the images to see what my, my, my GBR, my augmentation options are. Um, I'm, you know, trying to assess the quality of the patient's overall health. I'm talking to them, trying to build expectations. Like there's a fair amount of pre-surgical work that goes into this, that if you don't do, then you're going to have hiccups along the way, whether it's in your patient expectations, whether it's in your decision of what type of flaps you're going to lay, what type of bone you're going to use, are you going to use a screw or not? 
like a lot of that stuff, I just hate trying to wing it in the moment. So I like to be pretty prepared. And so I will typically spend an hour to an hour and a half really studying the case, or I might shoot some images off to some of my, my colleagues that I've worked with and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this, you know, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, and sometimes they're like, oh yeah, that's what I would do. Or sometimes they, they give me different ideas that I might either use or incorporate. Um, but you, you definitely, I don't recommend flying blind on these cases or flying in ill-prepared. Um, because you just, this is a very sensitive area. In this case, this was a, you know, a young 20 something year old, you know, very pretty attractive uh, young lady. And so, you know, what you're doing could potentially have permanent lifelong consequences. So you really don't want to wing something like if there's ever a case on a patient type not to wing is this one here, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, preparation is key in, in everything, but definitely surgery. Gotcha. Well, you know, what I want to do is um, I want to stop here for this case okay. and, and, and just kind of for this podcast, but I want to see if maybe you'll come back and do the next presentation, you know, oh, um, anytime, whenever you're man. available for that. I know you're a busy man and I don't want to, you know, I want to kind of tease us. I don't want anybody to just get out. <laughs> uh, you know I mean, I don't want everybody to get the, the whole meal, you know. All right, I want, right, you right, know? right. Uh, this, this we do. We want people to, we want to spread out the podcast a little bit, you know. <laughs> no, absolutely. But if you don't mind, I would yeah. love to hear both of yours perspectives on mm -hmm. some of your tactics and strategies. Um, and maybe some of the things like, you know, I would love to see your, your synopsis on that little defect that I got and what you may or may not have done different um, at, at, at any point in this surgery. Right. Uh, so start for me personally, start from the beginning. Um, you did something that I, I'm a little nervous to do, uh, which is you basically went at it from just a, a particulate point of view. You right. said, I'm just going to go ahead and use a tenton screw, right? Uh, and then you're going to put the part, um, the allograft, the particular all allograft around and just use that, right? I've, I've actually done well with using um, block graft in, in that area. Okay. You know, with that much of a defect, a block graft for me, and of course, screwing it and holding it down has mm -hmm. also done very well. Okay. Here's uh, the, the advantage that you have, um, oh, I'm sorry, in combination with particulate around it. Okay, advantage that you have when it comes to just use a particulate is some block grafts can actually break or separate from the uh, um, from the na uh, from the natural bone that was already there when you go to place the implant. Sometimes, so you have mm. to be very cognizant of that and right. take your time. You know, you can't have the torque and pressure uh, that exceeds you know forty uh, newton centimeter. Right. You see, so that's, again, something that once you, you learn and understand, you may say, you know what, I'm only going to do the particular or I'm going to do the block in combination, you see. And, and when you do the block graph, then you're basically building out a lot. Right. You know, I'd rather, like you said, over engineer uh, in that situation. So I won't have to do the double, um, uh, the double uh, um, uh, bone grafting. Gotcha. You see, gotcha. Uh, so again, the... The results, I mean, that you got are incredible. I think this was a really good result. You know, it's just that this is another way of going, right? It's kind of right. like we're both trying to get home. I'm right. going to go on the highway. You're going to take the, you know, the side road. Right. But in the end, you may have a better scenery than I might have. <laughs> but in the end, we're going to get home. And I think that that's really what matters is in the end, what makes, what makes you feel comfortable mm -hmm. and what's going to get you the results that you're looking for. Right. Where, where do you harvest your, uh, your blocks from? Right. Uh, so for me, you can uh, go right here uh, mm -hmm. and just take it from like the, the, the chin, the lower chin area. Uh, you can also take it from the ramus and the posterior. And uh, they have trephine bursts that you can actually trephine the okay. bone particle. And then especially with such a small defect, you can actually trephine and actually get the exact shape uh, that you need. Okay. You see, and I've done that, and actually, because I saw it on uh, Dental XP, and I want to give a shout out to some of the Salama brothers, but taking that trephine bird, it gives you a perfect circle that you right. can then lay into that spot, and then gotcha. use uh, particular bone around it. Gotcha. You see, and so that actually has worked out really nice in certain cases, and yeah. but most of the time, I'm going to say 90% of the time, I'm just with you. I'm using particular. Gotcha. When, gotcha. You're, when, you're, doing like, those, when you're doing those block graft, or uh, 
harvesting from a second site. Yeah. Is there any objection from the patient that you are creating a second site? Surgery? Oh, yeah. I have to let them know that I'm literally going, and that's another uh, discussion, is I'm creating a second area of, of surgery that's right. you know, tough to kind of explain to patients. But right. it's something that I'm like, I'm, I'm looking for height and width, you know what I mean? Mm. So I'm trying to get both. Right. And for me, just like you did, and again, I, I think I, was, I appreciate what you said was, I don't want anything collapsing in. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was, that's the ar argument that I have, is I don't want it to collapse in, so I need to go ahead and do this for, for that reason. Right. You know, uh, but that tension screw, honestly, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to tell you that I'm going to start doing more of. Okay. <laughs> so that, no, right. And then so that I don't have to do that block graft situation, but that trephine burr, to get it uh, from that back area is really easy. It's pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And then you just paste, you basically take a long screw and screw that bone down with it. Okay. You see, so again, that tenton screw, great idea. Um, you don't have to go to another uh, site uh, for any kind of additional surgery. Patients would love that. It's right. kind of like whenever you do soft tissue, can you use all uh, alloderm or do you have to go to the palate? Most patients would rather you use alloderm. Right. right, so that you don't have to go to another site to harvest from. So again, right. as we as we uh, get smart and as we have these conversations, you gave me ideas. Right. You see what I mean? So no, this is like this is why I think it's so critical to kind of see different things. I mean, I'll call Kyle and be like, "Hey, Kyle, look at this. Uh, how would you, from a restorative point of view or from a surgical point of view, how would you take care of this?" Right. And I've actually asked Prasadana's about um, defects that I've had on a, um, on a kid actually recently, it was a kid with a um, congenitally missing lateral. Mm -hmm. We grafted that area, we got the, the implant in there, everything looks really good except for uh, on the mesial aspect of number 10. So between nine and 10, we have just like that, a little, um, uh, 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 what's it called, black triangle. Right. Yeah. So I basically told the patient, hey, go back and have your dentist contour the 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 tooth the actual crown itself and right. i got that from a prosthodontic friend of mine yeah yep. you see and so that's why i asked that question from your point of view so yeah isn't it isn't it amazing when when you're you're uh, open enough to collaborating with your colleagues um outcomes just inevitably just get better um <laughs> you know when, when when you have multiple great minds looking at something and trying to solve a problem you you can't fail and that's one thing i hope a lot of of you know, clinicians and future clinicians watching this is don't be so stuck in your either either your ego mm -hmm. or your your apprehensiveness to put yourself out there to ask for opinions from people that that have experience and or know how, um, because ultimately it's not about your ego or it's not about your shyness. It's about getting the best patient outcome. Um, and if I can reach to reach out to you know to to you two or any one of my buddies here and say hey, I need some help or I'm not I don't know exactly how to approach this then, you know I mean that's if if my interest is taking care of the patient then we that's just something we have to do. Yeah. Actually, I want to also ask a question about so in the first stage you did the pap papilla sparing um, incision, right. second time you said you didn't want to do that because you realized that you had the bone there. So right. then I guess the question for me is, why did you do it the first time? Um, I, I was just being, I think I was just being overly cautious. Okay. Um, and then after laying that first flap as conservatively and seeing that, you know, being able to see most of that underlying bone mm -hmm. and just feeling more confident and good about it, I said, all right, well, you know, I don't have to be as sensitive the second time around. Um, and, and what I was trying to do initially, if you can see my cursor here, I was trying to avoid having a big contour right in the middle. And then, I, especially since I was trying to over-engineer it and then a drop off to the natural contours. So what I was hoping was to extend the flaps out a little bit, add a little bit more volume. So there's a, a easier transition mm -hmm. from this area that I knew was going to be thick and bulky to the, 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 the natural contours that we had. I think I was able to get a better melding on this distal end. Here you can see kind of a drop off, you know, it's big contour and then it kind of drops off to the, the natural contour. And of course that little defect that I have doesn't really help when you like get your eyeballs really close to it. But I, I was trying to kind of engineer just a smooth transition from the middle part 
to the natural contours. And I, and I felt I had to extend the flap out just a little bit more to do that. What would be, uh, so let's just say the patient has a, a pretty low lying frenulum, mm -hmm. right? Because if you look in the posterior, you see some of the frenum, like the pull uh, mm -hmm. of the, or the frenum uh, attachments. So if, if it was in the middle, uh, in the, between eight and nine, what would you do? Like, what would be your steps to this surgery? What would have changed? Um, honestly, usually what I do with those is I will, I would have made my flap to the outside of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I, I, I take a, a 15 blade and make an, a vertical incision right at that, that uh, uh, connective tissue point and then take my scissors and do some blunt dissection. Mm. Um, and usually when I reattach it, it's, it's, it's barely visible. Gotcha. Um, and so, I mean, I, I've seen people uh, uh, deal with freedoms in a lot more kind of uh, aggressive way i found that you know just kind of in incising and stretching that connective tissue is usually enough for me to when i reattach that flap it's it's almost negligible in the amount of pull that it pulls on it that it puts on it but definitely it, and it depends i mean if it's if it the freedom is here and you right. see on top of the freedom is at the papilla um that's something where we might do a phrenectomy before we even start right. um so then I, i'm not trying to do two three surgeries at the same time. Um, but usually you'll kind of see it where it's maybe at this level here. Um, and then by, di you know, doing a little blunt dissection, usually it, it's so diffuse by the time it heals that there's no pull on it whatsoever. Uh, you know, I think a lot of things that people don't understand and, and, and this comes with just more reading and stuff, but blood supply is key. Mm -hmm. Knowing exactly where blood supply is coming from right? Soft tissue, uh, interproximal um, bone, uh, different types of bone. Are we going to have more blood supply come from the mandible, maxilla? What type of bone do we have? You know, um, what are we doing with the adjacent teeth? Are we messing with the soft tissue and the adjacent teeth? You know, the PDL. There's so many different ways that blood actually comes to your surgical site. And I think the less you do, meaning the less you're cutting away at tissues, the better you seem to uh, heal, right? And I think right. learning blood supply and learning where the anatomy is coming from to that feeds your surgical site is going to be key to a successful surgery. And so right. I, I guess I want you to, uh, real quick, just talk about like what was kind of like your thought process when it came to releasing uh, tissue and so forth to cover your and get primary closure. Right. Well, one thing that I like to do is when I do my, my vertical incisions, I do them very diagonal to give us a wide base. Mm -hmm. So that way we're not interrupting uh, some of that uh, blood supply that's coming down vertically by going straight up and down. So having a really wide base is gonna ensure that the blood supply stemming from this portion of your mucosal tissue is gonna be relatively um, uninterrupted. The other thing to realize is that anytime you do a surgery in a site, almost every state step, and you know, I'm taking these lines from, from the Chacron, Chacron, uh, Joseph Chacron um, lectures, it's an ischemic attack, right? You're giving anesthetic. Anesthetic has what? It has epinephrine, which constricts blood vessels, which leads to some level of ischemia. You're laying a flap. You're making incisions. So you're either cutting through blood vessels or you're disconnecting those blood vessels from the underlying tissue. It's an ischemic attack. Your surgery, you know, if it's an hour, two hours, that's two hours where you're depriving the underlying bone of a blood supply. And so you really have to take steps to make sure that when you're reattaching tissue, you um, are making sure if, if I just have a flap of tissue here and I'm adding all this volume underneath. Now, when I go to close this tissue, it has to fit over that volume. If I put, if I pull on it too hard, and it's really stretching, well, again, you're constricting blood vessels and you're depleting the blood supply and it's yet another ischemic attack. So one thing I, I, I did forget, I'm glad you asked this question, um, uh, you know, and it allows me to explain how we can achieve good primary closure over the top of a large volume. Part of it is, if this is our tissue that we flapped up, and this is our attached tissue where my, my fingers are, and this is our mucosal tissue, when you lift that up, what I like to do is go right in the center of this mucosal tissue and start 
going with my, my 15 blade and making some incisions, which now opens up the inside of that mucosal tissue and gives it some flexibility. Mm -hmm. To my underlying, underlying my attached tissue, I will gently take my 15 blade and I will just score the periosteum. So that tough connective tissue that attaches soft tissue to bone, it's very thick and it's not the most flexible. So make some, making some small gentle slits through it allows it to stretch a little bit more. And the other thing I do is if here are my, verte my diagonal vertical incisions, I like to take my 15 blade and I like to score the mucosa just underneath those, um, the tissue that is distal to my, my diagonal incisions. And what that allows is then allows me to be able to pull that tissue over the volume without stretching it tight. And that's gonna allow me to close the site without constricting the blood supply. So we go from having here and trying to close over a volume and, and not fitting without really stretching it tight. So now we've released this and now it fits passively over that new volume. And that's gonna help ensure that we have a good, healthy blood supply during the initial healing phase. Also on top of using the, the platelet products that we use, which help form vascularity um, uh, in a surgical site uh, with much more e efficiency and quality um, than otherwise. Wow, that's, a, that's awesome. Um, can I ask uh, if, and th this is, you know, for the future, but mm -hmm. you, I know you present and do cases and, and, and do lectures. I know you're about to start a residency soon here. <laughs> uh, are you going to continue doing that? Are you and your partners going to continue doing that? And if so, how do people get a hold of you uh, for your lectures or at least just for your knowledge? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So even though I'm in residency, residency, I'm still going to be moonlighting doing, uh, doing actual work. Um, uh, just, <laughs> no, I, got, I, got, I, got, I got a mouth to feed, right? <laughs> um, so I'm going to be doing, you know, one to two Saturdays a month, uh, moonlighting, but we're also still going to be putting on our courses. So if any of your, your listeners or viewers on YouTube go to teachmeimplants.org, um, so that's uh, T-E-A-C-H-M-E implants.org, teach me implants, we list all our courses. Um, and we, we give notify you can sign up to be on our listserv. So I'll send you a case of the month every month and we give you updates on when our up, upcoming courses are. Or you can follow me on Instagram, which is just teach me implants. You can either look me up by name, Leroy Horton, or my, my uh, handle, which is teach me implants. Um, and usually I post cases on there. I post discussions. But anytime we have a course, I always advertise it on our story. Um, and on our posts. So there's plenty of ways to, to keep in contact with us. And we absolutely are planning on doing at least two courses a year, uh, live surgery courses where you come in for a lecture the first part of the day, and then you watch us do a surgery the second part of the day. So I appreciate gonna, you. Yeah, no, I'm going to, I'm going to, no, I'm going to actually like, um, you know, brag a little bit on you because I have a friend of, I actually have a mutual friend, uh, Marcus, uh, yes. who basically uh, took your course, opened his own practice, uh, and he's killing it, man. Like the cases he's doing are incredible, you know? And he, you know, to me, that's exactly how to do it properly. Right. You know, everybody always says, oh, don't you like, do you get mad when like general dentists do implants? I said, no, I get mad when crappy de dentists in general do implants. <laughs> <You know? laughs> to me, I don't care who does implants. It's just, just don't be crappy about it because then right. you're going to give everybody a bad name. Right. You yep. know what I mean? So the, the, the knowledge is basically taking the time to, seek out people like yourself uh, that can absolutely teach you the right way. Yes. And, and Marcus Rhodes uh, out in uh, the Houston area. Yes. Great yes. clinician yes. provider. I actually met him when he was an undergrad student and um, mentored him. So I, I was teaching in the summer enrichment program. I'd already graduated and was practicing. We stayed in touch. He uh, got into dental school at UW and then actually came to work for me after graduating. And so not only did he take a, a number of um, our, probably all our courses that are our different courses that we offer, but, you know, I, I did get, you know, a good solid year plus with him of just working for me. He shadowed a lot of my cases. I was able to help him and we still collaborate on, on, on cases uh, to this day, even though he's moved down in Houston. So he's, he's, a, he's a great provider and you're right. You, to do it right, it takes time, it takes patience, and it takes dedicating yourself to uh, continued learning. I, I, Kyle, I think that was it right there. 
think <laughs> that, that, that ends it. That was, that was perfectly said. That was yeah. perfectly said. Thank you so much for sharing all your information with us, giving everybody a, a free lecture here and definitely looking forward to the next one. Absolutely. Thank you guys for the platform. I've, I've enjoyed uh, interacting with you guys and following you guys and uh, keep up the awesome work. All right, man. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Enjoy all your right. Day. Take care. You too.